These days, everyone wants to visit Iceland. Tourism is booming in this Scandinavian island nation, accounting for almost 9% of the country's GDP. But it wasn't until the Eyjafjallajökull Yogotla volcano erupted in 2010 that Iceland's natural beauty was put on people's radars. Add on to that the weak krona from the 2008 financial crisis, and it created the perfect recipe for the exponential growth of visitors thereafter. Well, I'm just like everyone else. Iceland is one of those bucket list trips for me. On July 6th, we landed at Keflavik Airport. We took the flybus, an airport transfer service, into Reykjavik, Iceland's capital city. By the time we got going, it was half past midnight. You wouldn't know looking out the window, however, as the sun had only just set. Due to Iceland's latitude, you can expect around 20 hours of daylight in July, and even between sunset and sunrise, it's not completely dark. This was pretty cool to experience, although slightly disorienting. That night, we stayed at the student hostel, located at the University of Reykjavik. From our hostel, it was about a 15-minute walk into downtown Reykjavik. Here we stopped at Café Loki, a traditional Icelandic restaurant. We ordered a plate that included various toppings like mashed fish and sheep head jelly over rye bread and flatbread. We didn't know quite what to expect, but it was actually really good, and I especially liked how the bread was a little sweet. We also had to try skir, which is similar to yogurt, though technically a cheese, and it was served with single cream and sugar. Right across from the restaurant was Hatkvim Skirkja, probably the most famous landmark in Reykjavik. This Lutheran church was completed in 1986, and its unique design was influenced by Iceland's natural landscapes, particularly the basalt columns of Svartafoss. You can go inside for free or pay 1400 krona to go up the tower for a panoramic view of the city. The church is located right at the top of a major street lined with shops that leads right down into the main shopping street, Loiga Veger. After browsing the shops, we walked to Omnam, a chocolate and ice cream shop, which is also the location of their chocolate factory. Here we picked up some chocolate bars and had one of their ice cream creations. Finally, it was time to pick up our rental car. Before hitting the road, we made a stop at a bonus, an Icelandic discount supermarket. Given that we only had a week here, it wasn't quite enough to do the entire ring road. 
Instead, we decided to stick to the west and south of Iceland. We headed first for Snæfellsnes in the west, often nicknamed Miniature Iceland, for the diversity of landscapes found just within the peninsula itself. After about two and a half hours, we reached our accommodation, located in the town of Stikisholmer. We would stay here for two nights, so that we could spend the entire next day driving around the peninsula. Sometimes I get questions from viewers about my itineraries, where I stayed, what tours or activities I did, and where I ate. People really want the details, but up until now I haven't had a chance to put all this information together in one place. But I have a solution now. I'm really excited to introduce the sponsor of today's video, Planin. Planin is a travel booking platform that offers you up to 40% off your bookings when you're signed in. It's unique in that it also shows you recommendations from creators that you trust. On top of that, you can view guides that creators have put together for different destinations. At the moment, you can book both accommodations and experiences, but you'll soon be able to also book restaurants. Make sure you use my link below in the description to sign up for a free account, and you can also check out my recommendations to help you plan your next trip. I will be adding more details from my trips in the next little while, so make sure to hit the follow button so you don't miss anything. Now back to Iceland. We hadn't totally decided on where we would stop on our drive around the peninsula, so we started off the morning by visiting the visitor center. So we just went to the visitor center and we're going to go around this way, all the way around the peninsula. And this is where we are staying tonight. Yitri Tunga is a beach known for seal watching. The beach is also unique in Iceland in that it has golden sand rather than black sand. After crossing a bunch of the rocks, we were able to watch a number of cute seals lazing about by the water. Next on our list was Buda Kirkja, a tiny black church situated in Buda, which was once a fishing village and trading post. Nowadays, the only thing that stands here is this church and a hotel. We continued on to the small village of Arnastapi. Along the cliff sides here, you can see basalt column formations occupied by countless kittiwakes that are incredibly noisy. Just a bit further down, we also made a stop at the Londrangar Basalt Cliffs.
While driving around the peninsula, it was hard not to constantly pull up my camera. There was always something to see, always something that made us go wow. The horses and sheep also decorated the landscape nicely. Olafsvik is a small fishing town with a population of just over a thousand people. It's home to the unique looking Olafsvik church, which was built in 1967. It's designed to look like a boat from the side, but a cod from above. Last but not least, the iconic mountain featured in Game of Thrones. This distinctively shaped mountain is possibly the most photographed mountain in Iceland. Formed during the last ice age, Kirkjufjall would have been situated between two glaciers, with its summit peeking out. After this, we were off on our way, heading back to Stikisholmur for the night. It was time to start driving back down from Schneifeldsnes, but first we had to fill up our tank. We were now headed for the Golden Circle, the most popular route for tourists to take in Iceland. It features three major natural attractions and can be done as a day trip from Reykjavik. Over two hours later, we arrived at our first stop on the Golden Circle, Thingfetle National Park. The name literally translates to assembly plains. Iceland's National Parliament, which is the world's oldest legislature, was founded here in 930. It only moved to Reykjavik in 1798. But that's just its historical significance. Geologically, it's also the site of a rift valley between the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates. These plates move apart about two and a half centimeters every year. Overall, it's a beautiful park with lots of natural wonders to see. The next attraction on our route around the Golden Circle is the Gaysated Geothermal Area. Fun fact, the English word geyser, which is defined as a periodically erupting hot spring, actually comes from the big geyser here called Geysir. Geysir no longer erupts reliably, but you can see the smaller one called Strukke, which erupts about every 10 minutes. Gutfoss was our last stop on the Golden Circle. It's Iceland's most famous waterfall and it really is spectacular. 
The crevice that it tumbles into is about 32 meters deep and formed at the end of the Ice Age. Falling into it would be fatal. After wrapping up our tour of the Golden Circle, we drove down to Selfoss, a town in southern Iceland. Here we grabbed a quick Icelandic hot dog for dinner. I'll tell you more about them later when we visit the most famous stand in Reykjavik. Um, and two regular hot dogs. Yes. Okay. For the last leg of our Iceland trip, the plan was to travel along the south coast of Iceland. Before setting off from Selfoss, however, we checked out the new old town area and grabbed a skier bowl from Isai Skier Bar. Selja Lansfoss is an impressive 60 meter tall waterfall, unique in that you can walk right behind it. You will get a bit wet though, so be prepared. Since it was also raining, we got pretty soaked, so we checked into our hotel to dry off. Once it seemed like the rain was easing, we headed out again. The Black Sand Beach Rain Asiara is one of Iceland's most iconic landmarks. However, black sand beaches are found all around Iceland. The sand was formed from volcanic lava. At Reynes Fjara, you'll also see basalt columns, sea stacks, and other geological features. While this beach is beautiful, it is also dangerous. Powerful and sudden sneaker waves can pull unsuspecting visitors into the ocean, and at least five tourists have died here because of it in the past decade. Make sure you read the sign at the entrance and follow the warnings. The village of Vik is right next to Reynes Fiara, so we decided to have dinner there. Finally, just before leaving, we paid a quick visit to the church located on top of the hill. From here, you can get an excellent view of the village and beyond.
Our hotel included free breakfast with a great variety of food options, which I always find to be a huge perk when traveling, especially in more expensive and remote areas. We were particularly excited today as we were going on a very cool tour. It was a bit of a drive from where we were, two and a half hours each way, but I can tell you that it was very much worth it. The Ingalls Hovde Puffin Tour we booked is offered by a company called From Coast to Mountain, an Icelandic family owned and operated business that has been running tours here since 1990. We felt certain that we would be in good hands. To get to Ingalls Hovde, an isolated headland home to thousands of seabirds, we rode a hay cart for about 30 minutes across 7 kilometers of black sands. This area used to be covered with water, which would have made Ingolf's Hovde an island. Eventually, the cape came into view. When we reached the bottom, we stepped off the hay cart and hiked up the black sand to the top of the headland. Along the way, our tour guide shared with us the history of the area and interesting facts about the wildlife. Finally, what we came here to see, puffins. These little seabirds like to nest in burrows on the cliff edges and dive into the water when they need to feed. So it was important that we maintained a good distance from the cliff sides, as one could inadvertently step on a burrow. The puffins found here in Iceland are Atlantic puffins, and the best time to see them here is between late June to early August. They were extremely adorable, and one of my favorite facts that our guide shared with us was that they incubate their eggs by tucking them under a wing. Our guide took us to a number of different spots to observe them, and we spent an ample amount of time sitting around quietly with the puffins. The company has ensured that people coming here maintain a respectful relationship with the birds, so they had no reason to see us as a threat. After an hour and a half touring the beautiful Cape, we headed back. I think this tour was hands down my favorite experience on this trip. That evening, we had dinner at the hotel restaurant, making sure to finally order some of that delicious Icelandic lamb. Our Iceland trip was coming to an end, but we had a bit of time left to check off a few more things in Reykjavik. First, Breith & Co, a bakery specializing in sourdough bread and known for their delicious cinnamon rolls. Next, the Icelandic Phallological Museum, which boasts the world's largest display of penises. With over 300 penises obtained from more than 100 mammal species, this was truly one of the more unique attractions I have visited.
To top it all off, we went to the famous Icelandic hot dog stand, Bayerin's Best of Pilsur. Hello. Hello. Can we get two hot dogs, please? Yeah, we never said Yes, please. First set up in 1937, the stand has since expanded into a chain. Icelandic hot dogs are different in that they use mostly lamb meat, and the condiments include fried and raw onions, remoulade, sweet mustard, and Icelandic ketchup. Definitely a great choice for something both tasty and affordable here. Until next time. <laughs>